making the salad bowl was the hardest CNC project that I've ever done. I'll tell you why, but first let me describe how I got to this point. So I made this wooden epoxy salad bowl, but I glued up a huge block of wood to make it, and I started to think about how wasteful that was. You could save a lot of wood by gluing up six sides to the shape and using the CNC machine to cut out all the angles. But a nice flat piece meant I could create a one inch deep inlay and have it show up on both sides of the bowl. And this, this was my downfall. I had to do a ton of tests to get the absolute best wood inlay. And what you see here, they aren't even everything that I did. One side inlays are typically done with a V-bit. They allow you to get sharp corners and nice details, but they wouldn't work when I want to do a one inch deep carving and have it show up on both sides. This meant designing a pattern that would fit within the confines of a circular bit's radius. I picked a 1 8 of an inch bit, which meant I had to make all the radius shapes 1 16th of an inch or a little bit bigger. An inlay consists of a female pocket and a male plug. The two pieces will never fit together if you have a zero tolerance. You have to either make the female inlay a little bit larger or you have to make the male plug a little bit smaller. If you try to push together too tight of a fit, it will generally crack the wood. So let's talk about the series of mistakes that I made to get the perfect tight inlay. First, I did a series of tests using some scrap pine wood because it was cheap and I had it around. One mistake that I made was I keep cutting out the entire shape. Eventually, I settled on using a smaller test piece to find the perfect fit and this minimized wasted wood. But also notice that I'm not using pine. As soon as I started doing tests in hardwood, like cherry, I started to get some burning. To solve burning, you have to either increase the speed at which you're cutting, meaning the inches per minute, or decrease the RPM of the spindle. I chose to decrease the RPM of the spindle because increasing the speed would have left a worse cutting finish. So eventually I made a good fit, and here's how I made the female pocket. I started with a piece of hardwood cherry. I aligned it on my CNC table using the black dogs to position it at the same spot again and again. Then I used my 3D printed clamps to hold down the workpiece. That way I didn't have to worry about hitting them. The female inlay was too small to use a larger roughing bit, and so I had to use my eighth of an inch bit that I would also use for finishing. Now, this isn't ideal because roughing with a finishing bit will make it dull a little bit quicker. The upcut bit did leave some fuzzies on the top, so I hit it with my sander to remove those. Next, I went on to making the male plug. I used a piece of walnut in order to give it a good contrast against the lighter cherry wood. I used double side tape to hold down the plug because I had to cut out the entire shape. I scraped the tape really hard on the top to get good adhesion before removing the backing. I used those same dogs as before to locate the piece on my CNC table, and I stuck it down. Sticking it down alone usually isn't good enough to hold it, so I temporarily clamped it down briefly, which helps get good adhesion, and then remove my clamps. I had to do shallow passes to avoid chip out, and I start with a quarter inch bit to do a lot of the roughing and remove most of the material. I then did another roughing pass with my eighth of an inch bit, and then I could do a profile to cut out the entire shape. I was still getting chip out in some of my pieces, which kind of ruined them, and I ended up covering the top with blue tape, which really helped hold it together and prevent some chip out from happening. It also made the top finish a little bit better. Now, I'll talk about the glue up process in just a little bit. If I pause the video and zoom in a bit, I can see that there's just a little bit of a gap right here. I carefully looked at my plug and realized it was kind of wavy at this point. I had to figure out what was happening and what went wrong. The roughing tool pass wasn't removing any area in this tight gap, and so the finishing pass was doing a full depth cut like over one inch with a eighth of an inch diameter bit, which is just too stressful on a bit like this and cause it to wave a bit. So I could correct this by doing a couple of step downs on the finishing pass, which made it not have any issues. 
So I fixed this problem by doing step downs on the finishing pass, but eventually it actually caught up with me. Even after I fixed the problem, the bit broke, and it probably was just stressed out at this point from getting burning and doing a bunch of full depth cuts. So at this point, I was getting a really good finish on my inlays, but I had another problem. My female inlay was developing a slight crack consistently at this same spot. I asked for some help on the Avid CNC Facebook group, and someone suggested adding a bottom skin to kind of hold it all together. I thought this was a great idea, and so I had to go back to my model and redesign things, and I made it about a sixteenth of an inch thicker. Cutting this shape out worked great, I no longer had the crack, but it caused another problem. My pieces no longer fit together well. First, let me talk about how I glued up the pieces. The general process is to use a small brush to coat all the nooks and crannies of the male plug. If the fit was right, I could push them in fairly easily. So for tight fits, I was trying to use clamps to kind of squish them together, and that worked some of the time. Quite a few of the times I clamped things together, I would get some fine cracks in the wood, and I just had to go back and adjust parameters until it stopped cracking. I could make the inlay looser, and eventually it probably would fit, but then it would be a bit gappy, and I didn't want to do that. I attempted to relieve some of the pressure in the bottom by drilling some holes in it, and that way the glue and the air would escape as I squished them together, but that didn't help. So I went to Harbor Freight and bought a 20-ton press. I set up my pieces and I pressed them together. The use of the press allows it to exert even pressure and gets it really straight without any binding. And this was essential and it worked great. So the general idea is to make this pyramid shape out of the inlay pieces and then I can create a smaller little pyramid and glue it on using a dowel to align it in the proper location. I can make six of those for the hex shape and then I can glue them all together and create the base stock piece to start my machining with. The finishing pass would eat into the spoil board a bit and so I used a scrap piece of MDF as a sacrificial spoil board and used my normal tape technique to hold the workpiece down. Again, offset precisely an inch from each side so I can consistently align it again and again. My general idea is to have the pattern replicated on every other side. So some of them are going to be plain and some of them are going to have the inlay. There's nothing too fancy about the machining. I do a roughing pass and then a finishing pass with a ball nose bit. I made the mini pyramid by first gluing together two pieces of cherry wood and then I used some double sided tape to attach them to another piece of MDF as a sacrificial spoil board. The first operation was to do the back side where all I did was just to drill a hole into it. And then I could flip this over and attach it back onto the mini spoil board using a dowel to align it to that piece. This meant I could get a consistent location off of that hole. But once I knew that would work, I decided to do three at a time to kind of save some time. And I just spaced them out by one inch and replicated the toolpath in Fusion 360 again and again. Now, this seemed like a great idea until I started machining it. I actually didn't do a simulation of all three at the same time and I started to hear that horrible hitting noise that you never really want to hear on a CNC machine. And so if I zoom in here, you can see the collet was actually hitting the second piece and burning it. It was just too high. And the stock had a lot of additional waste that I didn't need. And this was because I just glued together two pieces and I knew I could machine it away. So I decided to just leave on the spoil board, hit feed hold, and stop the spindle then go ahead and chip that away a bunch of the material manually. I just use a chisel and a little saw to do it, a coping saw. And that was enough material for it to not have a collision. And then I could go ahead and do the toolpaths 
without having any problems. I could fix this in Fusion 360 for subsequent ones by doing a top cutoff first. I could then glue the mini pyramids to the main piece. I used that dowel to align it on the main piece and glued it up. The dowel worked pretty well for alignment, but I did have a little bit of a lip on some of them. Now, I'm not sure if I really like this next step or not, but I felt like I could make the pieces align a little better by cleaning them up on a piece of sandpaper glued to a piece of melamine. And while I think this worked, I also think it reduced the size a little bit and made them not align up perfectly. So at this point, I needed to glue six sides together and they had incredibly weird angles. The way that I thought I could clamp these would be to make a jig that was a hexagonal shape, perfectly matched to the outside of the bowl, or the stock really, and if I clamped it down, it would exert some forces inwards and hold everything together. Or at least that was my theory. I decided to make two of these clamp positions, one for the top portion and one for the bottom portion to hold it together tight. The glue up was a little bit hectic. My general process was to again put it on another type of mini spoil board that I covered with some tape to prevent glue from sticking to it. And I needed the pieces to not slip out as I was clamping them together initially. So I just gently taped on some alignment pieces on the bottom to kind of hold them where they needed to be. And from there, I just popped them all off once I had an order I liked and started adding some glue. I always like to wait overnight until I actually do the next operations from the glue up. And so the next day, I could remove all the clamps and pop off the clamping jig. And then I had a nice base piece to start machining the bowl out of. One of the things I was worried about was having the bottom being perfectly level, so I did level it up a tiny bit with some sandpaper. For most of my bowls, I always machine the bottom and outside of the bowl first, and I do it upside down. So I use the same alignment jigs to kind of get a general position of where it would be on another scrap piece of MDF. And then I put double-sided tape along the top lip. I tried to use as much tape as I could because unlike my other bowls, there wasn't going to be a lot of surface area to hold this thing down, and I was worried it might pop off. I used the same techniques as I did for everything else. I put the double-sided tape down and on, scrape it really hard, put my workpiece down on the table, and clamp it on really tight to ensure it gets really good adhesion. Once I put it on my CNC, I realized I was going to get some collisions with the bottom of my gantry, just a tiny bit. But that's okay because the bottom piece really wasn't needed. I could hop over to the bandsaw and just cut off the excess waste. Really, this was just a ramification of gluing up the pieces. From there, I spent quite a bit of time just making sure the bowl was exactly aligned. I kind of eyeballed it and also just did some math to make sure everything was roughly centered as best I could. The machining operation was relatively straightforward, just doing the normal roughing pass. One of the things I was aware of is that my dust boot would actually hit, and so after it got a little ways down, I could pop it off, and from there, I just had to ensure it wouldn't hit and have any collisions. I verified this at first by doing one and noting that it would clear everything. The finishing pass was with a quarter inch ball nose bit. At this point, I used the exact same jig that I had made for my previous bowl that had some epoxy. I'll link to it so you can check it out. And this just aligns things with some holes on my spoil board. I go ahead and tape it down onto my workpiece and put the alignment dowels, flip it over and squish it down and get it to have really good adhesion. From there, I can start the machining operation, doing a roughing pass as usual. I used a down cut bit in this case because I felt like the down cut bit was giving me a little bit better of a finish and having less chip out. Once I popped it off the machine, it was over to the sanding table. 
I started with the usual 150 to kind of get smoothed up a bit and then popped over to 220. This involved a bit of hand sanding, but it wasn't too bad. For the finish, I like to use Osmo Top Oil on my bowls. It's really easy to apply. You just wipe on a really thin coat and wipe most all of it off. Let it dry eight hours and repeat the process. I usually add three or four coats and that gives it a nice satin sheen. All right, let's take a look at the finished piece. I'm really happy with how the bowl turned out. It was a lot of effort and a lot of experimentation to get to this point. I made two bowls that turned out great. I'll have one available for purchase on my website, and the other one's going to be a gift. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I always appreciate hearing from people. Subscribe because it encourages me to make more videos. I'll see you guys later. Bye.